All right, welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 847. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. The day is March 12th, 2024. All right, we want to thank you for joining us for another... I can't talk today because, I don't know, I just have <coughs> coffee. I, yeah, it's pollen season. Hold on. You know, I drink coffee. There's about five or six people out there. It really bothers. They say I slurp too much. Well, I stopped slurping, but I'm still drinking my coffee. Uh, let's, uh, here, let's start this over again. So, welcome to another program of Anglican on Skitta. We're glad you could join us. This is Kevin and George's happy place, and we want to make it your happy place, too. We sit down and we talk about some of the hard issues. This week, it's not so unscripted. When I write the show notes, when George and I talk before the show, there's like a sentence here, a sentence here next to bullet points. When George sends over his thoughts, they're bullet pointed, they're correctly uh, uh, marginalized, and every sentence is spelled correctly with all the right grammar, and it's, it's not so unscripted when george gives the notes but it's going to still be a great show because we're fun that way george how are you doing this week very good uh, we're looking forward to saint patrick's day dinner at the church this saturday mm -hmm. i had to spend a whole day getting a liquor license so we can sell beer uh i don't know if it's going to be green beer but uh, uh that's coming up then of course easter Palm Sunday. Mm -hmm. We're going to have baptisms, adult baptisms. It's a lot of fun, a lot of preparation, a lot of work. We're doing baptismal preparation courses, uh, our Lenten studies. Busy, busy time of year. Oh, that's great. Uh, and it is a busy time of year. I mean, this is the time uh, right after Easter, Jill and I are going to uh, take our RV on the road again. We're going to head out to see the eclipse and then just kind of do a, a west tour through the um, national parks and go up to Idaho and I, I'll put my map, or it's draft two or draft three right now, on the uh, Facebook page, pretending we are retired. And that's where you can watch our travels and see what we're doing from day to day or where we break down again. You know, it, it's, it, it tracks all those things, George. That's the magic of Facebook. All right, let's uh, move on to the news. I have to pull up your document. Okay, a lot of words here. A lot of words. Uh, you start off. And we talked a little bit about this last week, that the Church of England has suggested, hey, we got all this extra cash lying around. Why don't we do slave reparations? We'll put bundles together and we'll give it to those people who are descendants of slaves uh, because we were really bad people at the time. And I don't think, it kind of went over like a lead balloon. They got the money, but is that the right place to spend it, George? Yeah, last week we talked about the news of the uh, uh, Independent Advisory Committee that recommended a billion pounds in reparations for the past for atoning for the sins of slavery at the Church of England. Mm -hmm. And this week we've had the reactions, and the reactions have been very harsh. Uh, the Telegraph, the, uh, the Spectator, the Daily Mail, GB News, and other conservative outlets have taken the Church of England to task for being ridiculously woke. The Church of England has come on the radar of the uh, chattering classes, and those who are conservative are just lambasting the Church of England. Uh, Ian Paul, member of the Archbishop's Council, put out a piece basically pointing out the theological and historical idiocy. The Church of England was actually one of the heroes yes. in the battle against slavery. William Wilberforce in the evangelical movement mm -hmm. essentially uh, you put the Quakers to one side, but essentially the first major movement to end slavery in the Western world came out of the Church of England and the Christian faith. Now, the uh, pro side haven't given up either. Stephen Cottrell had an had a uh, op-ed piece which, with the unfortunate title that uh, reparations is what Jesus would want us to do. Whoa, wait a minute. Oh, okay. Eye. I need to address this right now, because I don't remember anywhere in the New Testament, uh, the, the Gospels, where Jesus said, I want you to go to Egypt and collect money for the reparations when they held the Jews slaves. I, there's nothing in there. I don't get that. That would have been a great time, because Egypt has always got money, George. 
Well, uh, where you ask yourself when Jesus was asked, what did this man do to be born blind? What sins did his parents commit? Yeah. And uh, of course, Jesus doesn't, you know, knock that one down. And then the Bishop of Croydon, it's an area bishop in London, who is, she is of Jamaican ancestry, said, well, the Church of England's got plenty of money to do this. And so essentially, we've got both sides hardening their positions. And the the arguments are coming down is, first, it's historically inaccurate. It's historically inaccurate to say that the Church of England was a, uh, a malefactor in this whole issue. They were a hero in this issue. The Church of England, uh, the, the English Navy's West Indi uh, West African squadron African, yeah. put down the slave trade mm -hmm. in the 1820 after the Napoleonic Wars were finished. And there's the practical consideration. This will further alienate the non-woke majority of people in the pews. Why would anybody in their right mind give a dime to the Church of England if it's going to go be given to race hucksters? Because we know how this works. Those people, uh, it's not going to, if they do give money away, it will not benefit uh, poor people in Jamaica or the Barbados or places like that. It'll go to consultants and lawyers and it'll all be stolen or appropriated by the <clears throat> by the bosses in these countries. The administration just, level. I mean, how yeah. foreign aid works, yeah. how all of this stuff works. The mm -hmm. kleptocracy uh, will steal this. And with the church, with the average person, was is, is it a rational, sound decision to support white guilt? Uh, no, it's not, because it's historically inaccurate. It's theologically ludicrous. And when you have uh, someone, a lightweight, intellectual light lightweight, Stephen Cottrell, saying this is what Jesus would do to try to sort of end the discussion, you know... Uh, this is a dumb move. <laughs> this is what John Lennon would do. It's, it's certainly, it's it's not a gospel narrative, and we know throughout the the reading of Scripture and the history of the Church that indulgences, paying for your your sins, uh, is not at all appropriate, and it's it's a heresy and apostasy. And I want to thank Stephen for Cretel and, and Justin Welby for bringing up more heresies and more apostasies because we haven't had any for three weeks now. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Well, if the Church of England is going to have to pay, then I think the, the nations of Nigeria, Ghana, Ivory Coast need to pay yeah. too because Africans sold other Africans into slavery. Mm. This was, you know, if, if your knowledge comes from watching the TV show Roots, which was fictional, uh, Alex Haley made it up. It's not a true story. And this is well documented and all this and that. So I'm not saying anything that should shock anybody. But whites chasing blacks through the jungles of Africa to sell them into slavery never happened. They were sold by other African tribes into slavery to white traders on the coast. Now, I'm not saying that's a good thing. Yeah, but we to just paint this in such stark uh, contrasts, good white people bad, black people good, uh, you're getting into Louis Farrakhan levels of uh, fantasy and idiocy, or Steve Cottrell level Steve fantasy. Cottrell, yeah. oh, yes. So, but we live in this uh, generation where we do feel, even as a conservative Christian, uh, we we have this built-in guilt. You know, I got here because I'm privileged, and I think a church like the Church of England feels privileged and wants to. Pay its indulgences. We we're sorry for what happened to the Africans in the slave trade. Here we're going to make up for it. Now they did this here in America at the National Cathedral. They said we're going to hand out money to hopefully find people who helped work on the National Cathedral, and and give them some money. I they tried to give it some out. I don't know if it worked yet. I I understand the desire to try and use money to make it right. That's not how Christianity works. And. Here we are, several hundred years past the event, and we have you know notable black celebrities in the United States. LeVar Burton, mm -hmm. who played uh, a character Roots, yeah. on Star Trek and was and in, the movie, in the, the original TV <laughs> Roots, Roots himself. Yeah, yeah. He's been a big public advocate for reparations. Well, he did one of these Ancestry.com things, and he found out that he is the direct descendant of a Confederate soldier. He is... 
the wrong side. <laughs> well, how does he pay himself reparations? He was a Confederate. His, his ancestors include Confederate soldiers and African Americans. So, what, you know, does he get a reduced uh, bonus? Um, and, you know, it's, 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 it's so silly. It's just so silly. It is this, silly because this. we have we have a one thousand foot mindset, not a ninety thousand foot mindset. When we're looking at a, a situation, all we can see is right what's right in front of our eyes, and what's right in front of our eyes is um, s the, the scar of slavery is still here. Yes, we got it. What do you do about the scar? Why yeah. Kevin, you, your family's you, you're like ninety nine and nine tenths <laughs> not Norwegian, yes. maybe a little sweet somewhere in the corner there. Well, and yeah, all the, the all the nations we invaded really, too, yes. You know, apart from enslaving the Irish during the Middle Ages, the Norwegians really were not that much into the slave movement. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. why should? What historical evil did your ancestors commit to oh, the so, African Americans? None to the African Americans, but there's not an island uh, in the North Sea there that we didn't try to invade. You know, <laughs> but so it, it. This is but, this is the lack of historical uh, awareness that we're dealing with. Yeah. But uh, and but the sad thing is that there's so many young people today who have been brainwashed. And I'll use that word brainwashed uh, by we, the culture we, in which no, we live. You need to change that word. They've been TikToked. 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 Okay. You, brainwashing. That's an old term. Uh, it's been redefined. It doesn't mean anything anymore. If you have no earthly idea what you're talking about, you've been TikToked, and uh -huh. so. So, that's that's the new term, and I just invented it. So, uh, you can you're you're free and welcome to use it. And you're right; they have no reference point because they're not getting an education in school anymore. George, I'm watching some of these board meetings where the the biggest debate is how many sex books can we have in the library, not the curriculum we're teaching our kids with math, reading, and the fundamentals of education and history. My uh, most enjoyable courses uh, in high school and college was history. I loved history because it was stuff I didn't know. I know more now because we have the internet and I can uh, cross-reference and, and uh, keep up with the stuff I keep forgetting every year. But kids nowadays don't have any reference to anything beyond 1973 to 19 or to 2024. That's their only reference point. And you're not doing yourself a service if you don't know how humans have failed before and how humans have achieved before. And we've done great strives uh, as Christians, great strives as human beings, great strives, great strives as great God's created humans uh, in trying to restore ourselves to him. However, you, you can't be a Christian and have guilt. That's wrong. You know? You need to restore yourself to the Father, not to other people. Once you restore yourself to the Father, and they restore themselves to the Father, you're whole. It's a triangle. Oh, I'm 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 bloviating. I'm sorry, people. Well, let's move on to the other to next other topics, which are so nicely laid out. You should write the notes every week. All right. So we often talk about the trans movement. Uh, this is where people are TikToked, brainwashed, and uh, told that. Uh, Gender is a scale, like a rainbow. And in there, you can be male and female, or male, female, male, or female, female, or you can be a, a soul, or uh, you can be uh, non-binary. You don't have to be male or female. And that there's just a spectrum behind gender. And this is the gender theory. And this is what they've replaced with uh, math with and reading with in schools. The first thing they're taught in kindergarten and, and as young children is, Johnny, you you don't have to be a boy. If you wake up one day and you want to wear a dress, you have evolved to the point where you can wear that dress and and feel like a girl and be and become a woman, and th th that's TikToked, and it's destroying our community here, mostly in North America. I see that Europe has kind of cleaned up their mess. The NHS won't allow trans surgeries anymore or uh, puberty blockers or hormone therapy for kids under 18. Good. You may win this game. 
here in North America, we can't wait to introduce our eight to 12 year olds to puberty blockers. You know, it's a, it's a human right. They would make it a constitutional right if they could. However, there's been some studies done to find out where the science is in this. The NHS has done a lot of uh, looking at this and came up to the conclusion that if you do not interfere with a person with gender dysphoria, uh, they will come out of it before they're 20. Two things have come down the pike recently that have basically knocked the whole transgender agenda mm -hmm. uh, back very hard. First was a Finnish study uh, that came out last month, which basically said that a study of every child in Finland over several year period who was uh, treated for uh, gender dysphoria and went through transgenderism. They found that the argument that unless you treat these children, they will commit suicide is untrue. There's no truth to that. It is not at all. The second thing is Michael Schellenberger is an independent journalist. He ran for, I think, governor in California. You'll see him on the Tucker Carlson show from time to time. He has gotten access to the files, the internal files of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, WPAT. WPATH. The yeah. body that has, uh, is the scientific body that has told us about you know hormone therapy and you know all these different surgeries and the internal documentation that that Schellenberger has provided shows that um, the standards of care put together by WPATH are not scientifically driven they're ideologically driven the internal communications of those involved in gender medicine show that they are ignoring and deliberately so and admittedly so to ignoring the science in favor of a political agenda in favor of transgenderism children uh you know, are unable to give informed consent that the incidence of cancers when you start this hormone therapy is astronomical compared to the uh, normal rate that the uh it's almost like we now we have the gender medicine doctors are our new Mengele's, the new people experimenting on the helpless and weak. You know, there's a famous case in Texas about a about a, a father who lost custody uh, to his uh, ex-wife over their child because he declined to support the wife's move to start transitioning this boy to a girl. The ex-wife began this when the child was two. Um, this is, you know, there's something mentally wrong with the woman, with the woman, the mother, number one. Yeah. And number two, there's no scientific evidence. All the claims of science that this is proper treatment have now been exposed to be fraud by Michael Schellenberger and his deep dive into the WPATH files. Well, hold on. You sound hopeful that the exposition, uh, the exposing of this is going to stop it. And I would say not a chance in hell will this stop because uh, the truth has been uh, revealed about uh, the transgender movement and, and WPATH. Because we had, uh, 12 years ago, somebody had hacked into the systems of a university and got the conversations of climate change uh, um, professors and climate change activists at the time that complete, they themselves in this email completely debunked climate change, but they said they had to go forward anyway because they were making money for the university. And this is a big hassle and scandal at the time. And for like almost six months, it made the news of every newspaper, including the New York Times. And then it slowly went away. The truth of climate change just evaporated from the media. And therefore, it didn't exist anymore. Well, we now live in a different world. We don't live in a world where the New York Times is taken seriously by many, many people, whereas once it was taken as gospel by many, many people. The independent media, uh, you know, Tucker Carlson will have 100 million views of a, of, a, of a broadcast that he does 
compared to what 300,000 for CNN. Mm -hmm. So the the media landscape is changing. Now will that change people's minds? Episcopal Church at their last general convention adopted a pro-castration and mutilation policy. Uh, children could decide. And will they change? No, because the crazies who run it will never ever admit that they were fooled or that they believe a lie. But what will happen is now that the science has been disproven, the malpractice, medical malpractice attorneys will start shutting down these clinics by bankrupting them. Because now we have the scientific evidence to show that these men are frauds, women are frauds who are performing these uh, mastectomies on 13 year olds and castrations of 10 year olds and hormone therapy. There's no scientific evidence that this does any good and it actually does tremendous harm. And the scientific evidence comes from the WPATH. Now this is going to bankrupt any doctor who wants to do this in the future. I'm not as hopeful as you are because I believe this is demonic and evil, that it goes beyond just information uh, gathering and truth, that there, there is an evil element. Uh, you know, I, I, I often say to my friends, you know, Satan proving, uh, Satan's biggest goal was to make sure that you didn't believe in him. Well, his second biggest goal is that you don't believe in who you are. And Kevin, are, are you saying that the Episcopal Church's general convention succumbs to the demonic? I do. Well, I'll say that if you won't. <laughs> yeah. I will. I, I recall a story. You've re recalled it to me, and several people who were there recalled it of somebody pouring salt around a delegation. Uh, at a certain convention in Minnesota, I think it was, and they reacted like demons. I just, you know, I, I'm going to put that out there. That's a story I heard. Um, that 1998 Philadelphia, I was there. <laughs> you were there. Nelson okay. Pashuski spread salt around the tables of the Diocese of Newark and Fort Worth, and Louis <sighs> Crew acted like the demons in the gospel story, you know, outraged. And not this outrage, screaming, outrage. screaming outrage. Yeah. And uh, the demonic has, uh, Satan is at work in the institutions of our church today. Mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, I can say that from the Church of England, being a member of, uh, not, I'm sorry, of the Episcopal Church. Yes. I can say that to the Episcopal Church, much of the leadership of the Church of, Eng of the Episcopal Church are influenced not by the power of the Holy Spirit, they're influenced by the demonic. They've abandoned the gospel, they've abandoned God, they worship the spirit of the age, or as our uh, uh, epistle from last Sunday said, the spirits of the air, Satan. They may not know this, but their fruits of their labors are quite evident. Uh, we can say this about the Church of England, the Episcopal Anglican Church of Canada, Mm -hmm. uh, many of the Anglican churches, um, it's not universal, far from it. There are good ministers, good congregations, even good bishops all across these places. But they're fast being overwhelmed by the attacks of Satan and his lies in destroying the good news of Jesus Christ, driving us into, if you will, the catacombs again. Um, yeah. Good, good thing, Kevin, that you and I live now down here in Hooterville. Hooterville. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Maybe when they, well, maybe when they finish building the highway to this area, mm -hmm. uh, it, I might be getting trouble because it's too much of a pain to get here otherwise. Well, it's interesting. I live here in Hooterville, uh, an RV resort where people who have large motor coaches like we have, uh, you've been here before. They park them side by side and wait for spring to come. And we talk to families here all the time who suffer the same issue that Jill and I are suffering, where the kids don't want to talk to us anymore. They don't want to engage. We have one child right now who's, uh, who knows she's loved, who loves us, and uh, nothing has changed from the time that she lived with us until now. Now, my other two kind of went to college, but I, that can't be relevant here. Uh, my, my college daughter uh, doesn't think that she needs parents and doesn't know or have any idea or concept of how to honor your mother and father. Um, and the, the, this new part of society that we see here is watching children uh, separate or divorce themselves from their families. And 
I'm not the only one. Almost every family I've spoken to here has a son or daughter who has separated themselves from the family over politics or religion. Because they can't, they can no longer have the ability to have discussions about it without um, going into emotional uh, rage. And that's on both sides. The parents don't know how to talk about it, and the kids. I'm not going to blame just the, the the kids here, you know. But we as families no longer how to know how to engage in the conversations of the days with without um, causing havoc, and we need to relearn that. The younger, the better. Yeah. Well. This is an example of Satan at work in the world, mm -hmm. spreading his lies, spreading his slanders. Satan is the liar, the deceiver. And we have a whole generation that is being est almost estranged from their life, their culture, their families, and being taught lies, mm -hmm. lies, lies. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh. remember, Kevin, when we were young, there was that one kid in your class who was always like worried about nuclear annihilation. There's one, you know, person who's always worried about that. The atomic bomb is going to go off any day now. And I hate to take it, but now that's gone from one out of 10, one out of 100, into 90 out of 100 worried about climate change or, or this or that or the other. Um, the lies people have been taught um, are so destructive. Well, and when we have the truth of Jesus Christ. In fairness, you and I were taught those lies. I remember in the 70s, I would go to my, my social studies class or whatever, and they would teach me about acid rain. And they would teach me about the, the, the hole in the ozone. And I was, I was told all these things. But over time, I discovered that it wasn't true because I kept myself informed. Uh, oh, there is no ozone. I mean, I remember reading the report in like uh, 93 or something like that. Ozone hole repairs itself. I remember reading acid rain was an over overreach. It never happened. I, and so I'm able to understand that uh, just because you're, you're, you're screaming the sky is falling doesn't mean the sky is going to be falling. And that having a scientist tell you that doesn't make it in, any more relevant. Um, so I think now that we're in the age of the TikTok, uh, there's just no ability to go back in time and, and see that they were wrong or realize that they were wrong. They will lie and say we were right. And that's the worst part of evil. George, let's move on to a different topic. We've talked this one to death. Let me find your page here. Uh, da, 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 da. Anglican Church of Canada backs government funding of UNRWA? U-N-R-W-A. U-N-R-W-A. Okay, yeah. UNRWA is the UN agency that uh, takes care of uh, Palestinians. And after the October 7th uh, massacres and murders, it was found that several hundred UNRWA employees were involved in this, either directly as killers or indirectly as holding prisoners, Israeli citizens captured and whatnot. And in response, many Western governments, including the United States and uh, Canada, cut off funding uh, for UNRWA. Well, the Trudeau administration in Canada has re-established funding and the Anglican Church of Canada has said, well done, good and faithful servant. And what we're seeing is the uh, Israel really should have been act, should have finished them off quickly, the, uh, the Palestinians, because the longer it takes, the more the uh, fence sitters like the Western churches are scrambling into the moral oh, equivalency trap. Stop. When were the Western churches ever fence sitters? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you know, Justin Welby and the Church of England are calling for a ceasefire, and they're blaming the Israelis for imaginary. You know, we had, uh, oh, was it last week? The uh, you cannot trust statements put out by the heads of churches in Jerusalem because they are all almost always Arab oh, yes. Muslim yeah. propaganda yeah. because they're dimmies. Yeah, they live under the uh, under the control of the Muslim world. So last uh, two weeks ago, there was an aid convoy uh, that uh, where there was a mob rush and several hundred pe people were either trampled to death or shot and killed. And of course, the the churches in uh, Palestine uh, blamed Israel. Well, investigation found it wasn't Israel; it was Hamas who killed these people. Well, and hold on, it's like these churches don't even live in the age of video. 
Okay, you're going to read a press release, you're going to herald the Hamas press release, and then a, a day later, you know, Israel's going to publish an unedited video showing that it was a lie, and are you going to correct yourself? No, you just go with the next press release. Well, I don't want to fully blame up the, uh, the churches for being ignorant and foolish. This U.S. Secretary of Defense was questioned before the Senate oh, saying... Uh, Austin, these figures you give for Palestinian deaths, where do you get them from? Uh, well, we get them from the Gaza Health Authority. Yeah. So the uh, people who are lying to us about all of this stuff, you're bullying their, their numbers. We have no idea how many people have died. We have no knowledge. We're told on one hand, you know, we see these propaganda photos of these starving children. And then if you zoom out, then you see these very fat doctors uh, standing over these poor starving children. It's a joke. And, you know, whatever you hear in the first weeks of war is going to be untrue. But the church is so foolish and so quick to pounce on the Jews and display that latent anti-Semitism that so many have in the Christian world or the Western world for Israel. Um, South Africa, of all places, they are, the South African government's decided to make itself an enemy of Israel and brought charges of genocide, which were found to be untrue. But the South African church has been backing that. Yet at the same time, we're seeing an actual killing spree of white farmers in South Africa. Has the Archbishop of Cape Town, Tabo Makoba, said a single word about that? No, he has not. Has he said a single thing about Julius Malema, who is the leader of one of the political parties, and he could very well be the prime minister one day. He will be the and next Malema prime minister. Yeah. calls for yeah. the expropriation of all white-owned property, and if the whites don't like it, we'll kill them. Have, this is real murder threats, mm -hmm. and, we'll, and it's backed up by farmers being murdered. And do we hear the precious little Tabo Makobas of this world condemning that? No. They're happy to condemn Israel, and doing so in a lying fashion. I wonder if they watch TikTok. I bet they do. And that is the problem is no matter what if it doesn't fit you, the narrative you want out you won't even acknowledge that information's out there uh well, did, did we hear anything of the state of the union address we're going to build piers to send aid to the gazans right. did we hear anything about the dozen americans still held hostage by these same gazans mm -hmm. you think president biden would have said a quid pro quo you release the americans <sighs> and we'll give you the aid no no, we're going to put a thousand troops on the ground in the middle of a war. And so we're now going to start the next war that we're involved in. Idiocy. Well, when it comes to America and little Bay of Pigs wars, yeah, we can do some stupid things. Um, we And the current people in charge of, of the U.S. government, I'm going to, you know, I, I can say this as a citizen, aren't looking to a future other than what, uh, the nightly news will cover that day. And they're not looking a week in advance, a month in advance. All they want is their headlines covered for that day because they have an election coming up. How do we stay in office? And hold on, make sure I got a little bit on my watch. Tesla stock is up. Uh, we just talked about Elon Musk. That must be it. So in a such... Uh, <sighs> It's hard to watch this, especially in a time of war, and especially, as we just referred to before, history. History shows us that um, the native uh, indigenous people of Israel happen to be the Jews. And the Palestinian conflict is something relatively new, only a couple of generations old, and it's treated like it's a 15,000-year uh, history lesson. It's not. All right. Let's move on to the next story here. Oh, and I sent you this story. Um, the Coptic Orthodox Synod says, um, we don't want to be in uh, communion with, and neither were really in communion, in negotiations or talks or even seen in public with Pope Francis and his team anymore. We're cutting, cutting you guys off. That's, that's big, George. This isn't tech. March, March 7th, the uh, Coptic Synod bishops met and they put out a very long statement uh, on homosexuality, homosexual acts. They're immoral and ungodly. And they laid out the theological and biblical stance on this position, a stance which, with which I happen to agree. 
uh, their logic and church history and biblical scholarship is impeccable on this point. And it's the same stance that the Roman Catholic Church used to have. A, yes. a, a little off. It's the same stance the Anglican Communion in large has, uh, except mm -hmm. for a couple of provinces. So the Synod made this very strong statement. And then the Synod uh, administrators and Pope Tawadros or Theodore II, Tawadros is Theodore in Arabic, is it? Uh, or Coptic. And they said, well, in light of this, we cannot have ecumenical dialogue with the Roman Catholic Church in light of the Roman Catholic Church and Francis's support for gay blessings. Because you're almost as bad as the Anglicans. Uh, so <coughs> Francis in the last two months have seen the, Ru the Russian Orthodox mm -hmm. say that you people are heretics are uh, over the uh, December 18th statement from... Uh, the Vatican, and now the cops are saying you people are heretical, unchristian. So, yes, there's always going to be differences and arguments and fights between the various groups in the Christian world over this and that, but we're now reaching the point where nobody, you know, in Coptic and Orthodox relations with the Vatican, and even with the Anglican world, there was always a disagreement over second order issues there was never any moral disagreements in other words we both you know basically believe the same sort of moral truths now that both the russians and the cops are saying to the vatican we don't believe the same moral truths you do okay. now this is what happened to the anglicans in their relations with the roman catholics when we went round the bend with the gene robinson affair the uh I re we can remember was it uh 2008 uh, Kevin, do you remember that there was a cardinal, Cardinal Gracias, I think it was, there was a cardinal who came to the Lambeth Conference oh, and said yeah. Anglicans are involved, are going through a bout of ecclesial or spiritual schizophrenia uh, yeah. because your Bible and your Book of Common Prayer and your history and tradition say this, but now I'm hearing you guys saying, yeah, bless gay relationships. So what? So the Catholics treated the Anglicans 20 years ago, 15 years ago, the way now the cops and the Russians are treating the Catholics. Uh, well, we, we reported the... If it weren't so distressing, it would be funny. <laughs> we reported how the uh, Southeast bishops had put out a statement a week or two, and we read that. It, some portions of uh, the Anglican Church are responding to Pope Francis. I don't see something from GAFCON or something uh, from like the uh, ACNA. Uh, saying, hey, this this is putting a strain on our relationships. I don't know, maybe GAFCON uh, feels it's too young to uh, complain to the Roman Catholics. I, I think you should at this point, because it would separate you uh, on some serious issues that would draw attention from the Orthodox Church, who you also want a relationship with. Well, with GAFCON, keep in mind that the Catholic Church in Nigeria and Kenya and all the GAFCON provinces That's are right. fully against what Francis has done. Yeah. So for the GAFCON churches, this is just attacking the Europeans, uh, not the Catholics in their own backyard. That's right, yeah. So it's not as pressing a concern because the African church, Catholic, Roman Catholic, the Catholic church in Africa has made it quite clear that they're not going along with what Francis has proposed. All right. This is going to be a, a meaty topic. Uh, we got 22 minutes before we hit the one hour mark. Let's talk Haiti. Um, Haiti, if you watch the news or you have any understanding of what's going on, has completely imploded the last uh, 10 days. The gangs have taken over. Uh, the general barbecue uh, is walking the streets uh, and he's not taking prisoners. The uh, unelected prime minister just resigned. To this morning or last night and it's all chaos this must be something new no haiti has been chaos forever made worse obviously uh decades ago centuries ago with the slaves and uh the slave trade and all that it, it's it's a complicated issue and we're not going to solve that issue or cover everything in the next 22 minutes but we need to acknowledge it because it's something we should be praying for. And 
something we need to avoid doing is send money at it. Throw some money at it. That that that's the only issue they have is they're they're poor, hungry, starving people. Well, no, money caused this issue. This most recent issue is caused by money. Money caused the issue right after the earthquake when uh, uh, President Bush and President uh, Clinton went around the world uh, seeking billions of dollars to, to give relief to Haiti after the earthquake. And that didn't go into relief. That went into the, the hands of the militias and the, the, um, just the, the most evil people inside of Haiti. Also into some condos in Florida. Well, so, whatever. And you know, the Miami Beach real estate is getting more and more expensive <laughs> with all these dictators and yeah. generals buying property there for because their retirement. Because we think the solution is free money, and it's not, George. It never is. Yeah. Hundred years ago, 1915, the U.S. Marines were landed uh, by President Wilson in <laughs> Haiti, and we stayed 10, 15 years. Yeah to basically form a police force because Haiti was ungovernable, unmanageable. Um, today, it, Kevin mentioned uh, General Barbecue or Barbecue. It's not his real name. He's what? called that because he's a gangster. Uh, mm -hmm. He is a gang leader. And there are videos of him and his men eating the flesh of their enemies after they've been bar after they've killed them and barbecued them. Uh, the the barbe general barbecue broke in and emptied Haiti's prisons. So all the prisons are empty. The prime minister was out of the country. He couldn't come back because if he did, he'd be killed. Mm -hmm. um, Haiti is in de facto civil war between gangs and the army and this and that. This church situation, the Anglican situation is pretty bad. The We've reported how the uh, former diocesan secretary and some very prominent priests have been arrested by the Haitian government for arms trafficking, where uh, containers that are marked uh, uh, relief aid actually had AK-47s and uh, machine and ammunition uh, that the gangs were controlling clergy and church officials to import weapons. Well, fortunately, these guys are now out of jail, so because the jails went empty, and. There was an editor. There was an editorial that we printed on Anglican Inc. by a uh, a fellow very much involved in the mission field, saying that American evangelicals really can lay the blame at Haiti's failure to thrive on themselves because instead of teaching a man to fish, we've given them fish. Haiti has been the source of billions, and it's the most visited country in the, in the world by American missionaries. And every time there's a problem, we fix things. But what we've done is created a culture of dependence and a culture that doesn't is not we don't do micro lending. We just go in and build stuff for people. Mm -hmm. We don't go and educate people. We don't you know, teach them how to farm. We send them food. Um, we don't build up industry. We send them bags of flour and wheat. And the result has been that Haiti does not have a culture uh, that will enable it to crawl out of its hole. Um, well, it, because, the current culture there is several generations of corruption, if not c centuries. You know, centuries, where th it's all they know is uh, the the economy of corruption, and if that's all you know, you're not going to be taught the right way by being giving more free money. And so, the, the, we as a church are not teaching them how to use money, how to use resources, how to you know replant their gardens, how to fix their houses. We are giving a top layer of money that just goes to uh, the corrupt government. And if it doesn't make it to the government, like now, it ha ends up in the hands of the barbecue people. Yeah. And it pay and there's our allegations that, for instance, the Clinton Foundation, uh, which raised billions of dollars for Haiti, very little of that actually wound up on the ground. Mm -hmm. Much of that wound up in... Uh, uh, consultancy fees for Hillary Clinton's brother, or uh, the costs of uh, the lifestyle of the Clintons going around the world raising this money. I have no knowledge whether that's true or not. Those are things that are in the newspapers. Those are allegations, days. yeah. Allegations, and I mm -hmm. don't want to be wound up dead tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> but the. Uh, I guess we laugh, but you know, the, it, it's true. But the. 
but the situ but I think there is a truth being said here, and that when you uh, when you create a welfare dependency system, it's one of the things that Daniel Patrick Moynihan in the 1960s, when uh, he was uh, President Johnson's uh, secretary for uh, secretary or something, secretary he, he pointed out the culture of welfare. Yeah. You know that basically encouraged young girls to have children not to get married not to work and so that several generations you know have arisen where the government funding uh promotes you know lifestyles that are demonstrably destructive I, saturday i was in prison uh um we're getting ready for a kairos weekend and okay. uh, in May. And, you know, Kairos is where it's a four day weekend akin to a casino, but you do it for the residents of a prison. And uh, the old, old story that I know from the number of prison ministry weekends I've done are, you know, kids, no father, raised in the streets of Miami or Tampa or Jacksonville. Um, their male figures are gangs. Um, they have, you know, men don't raise their family. Men yeah. don't raise families. They're all no. matriarchy with yeah. grandma and the mothers and the babies. And, the, and they don't work and the government checks take care of everything and but the men go off to prison. That's where the government becomes the father. The government mm -hmm. ha becomes the financial structure of that family. And in doing for, so, for, for, it replaces the need for a father. For the women yeah. and for the men, the gangs. Mm -hmm. Um become the male structures yeah. and there's some really important major work being done to break these pathologies of uh, crime and uh, and dependency but we're now 70 60 70 years into it and it's really going to take almost maybe that long to restore the family in many parts of the country yeah i mean as much as i disliked uh, President Bill Clinton, one of the things he did do was take on some welfare reform after he got uh, so beaten in the uh, uh, run-up election where he lost ha the Senate and the, the Congress to the Republicans and was forced to take up reform. He did a lot, but that's all been chopped away. They've slowly added back all those programs. Uh, however, now I see Oakland, uh, which is California City, now is going to require their welfare uh, welfare recipients to have jobs and take a drug test. This is a California town that used to be uber super super liberal. They don't got no more money. They they filed bankruptcy like eight years ago, and they they're gonna have to do, do it again. So, yeah. one of the amusing things is the current favoritism extended toward illegal aliens or undocumented migrants, yep, so however yeah. you wish to yeah. call it has caused uh, reactions in the Bronx and in Chicago and in other places because programs and facilities that had been set up for Americans, predominantly African Americans, are now being crowded out. So recreation centers in Boston are now being that were built in Roxbury are now being used to house house African Americans. So yeah. we used to, you know, years ago people would tease Al Gore and his midnight basketball. Oh, yes. to get black kids off the street yeah. to play basketball. Well, they don't do it anymore because now all those facilities are used to house illegal aliens and illegal aliens don't have to work to get money, whereas American welfare recipients in many cities and municipalities now are being required to work. So it will be interesting to see how all this plays out politically in the United States. And it'd be interesting to see how the church reacts as well. Uh, I've seen some churches start to be afraid of this. And you shouldn't be because this is a ministry field for you. This is where you can uh, show uh, Christian outreach and bring people into the church and and you know treat them as uh, the New Testament demands us to. Well, we had so, we had new. I had I had a fellow come to my door the other day uh, looking for a handout, and um, I said, okay, well, if you're willing to work for a few hours sure. to clean brush. I'll give you the money that you want. And but, it works. Uh, I'm not just doesn't hand you cash. Yeah. That but works. that works. Yeah, that works. Absolutely. We do that here. I mean, uh okay, if I see a guy outside the Walmart with you know, I work 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 for food, he probably won't. 
But because I'm a Christian, I'll probably stop by the McDonald's next door, get him a burger, and I'm not going to give him money. But I'll, you know, if you are truly hungry, I got I got you covered. All right. So there is no solution to Haiti that can be solved by government, that can be solved by money. Uh, we do think, uh, as Christians, that it can be redeemed by the loving faith in Jesus Christ, and we pray that. You know, we don't just don't just flippantly say it. Uh, Got to find your note sheet. Yeah, y your note sheet is uh, a page and a half long, where my sheet is like uh, like four four bullet lists. George, let me find where we are here. Okay, next story. This is a good story. Is Welby losing control? Uh, heck yes. Uh, he did an interview with the Spectator that he carries one of those panic buttons. Uh, it's not really a life alert. Uh, here in America, we have certain uh, judicial people, SCOTUS uh, members, the, the Supreme Court. They have uh, those little uh, buttons that will bring the cops running. Uh, the judicial cops will come running and, and, and save them for whatever. Uh, our important senators, I think we have uh, some important leaders in the Senate that get it. If you're the d defense uh, communications and uh, whatever you get to have one. Not all the senators and not all the Congress would get him. They're expendable. But our Archbishop of Canterbury thinks he needs one. Well, that's cool, George. He must be really important. Yeah, because he's getting threats from members of the Church of England and members of Parliament. And okay, I have to say, whoever's doing the Archbishop's PR really needs to get fired or <laughs> or reset. This makes him look pathetic. Uh, just, you know, he has to be protected from his own church people. It's not like he's got to be protected from Islamist terrorists walking no. around. His country leadership and church leadership. And, yeah. members, and members of the House of Lords who are mean yeah. to him, who say that the Church of England is just a junior party to the Labour Party. Um, and so Welby's demanding panic alarms. And then, yes, maybe this is a cultural thing, but that I don't understand as an American. But in the Sunday Times, Welby wrote an essay for mothering for Mother's English Mother's Day was this past weekend, and where he talked about his poor relationship with his mother and how he refused to forgive his mother until she was on her deathbed, and he only forgave her for being a bad mother when his own son shamed him. I'm sorry, Kevin. I just don't need to know that. Uh, I mean, I, I feel badly for the man, but at a certain point, there needs to be discretion about what you share and what you don't share about I, your own life. I don't know. I, I do like personal stories. And I, I believe that the best communication a uh, rector or priest or pastor can have with his conversation, his congregation, is to be very honest about what he's going through, what she's going through. And honesty is a, a great policy. We practice it here on Anglican Inc. and Anglican Unscripted, where we, we tell people about our life struggles or our life achievements and our plans and vacations and families and stuff like that. And in small degrees, we talk about the weather in small degrees, degrees, weather, ha ha ha. And so I get it, but this one kind of went too far. And was he not the archbishop? When he his mother died, yes, yes, it was a year or so ago. Well, okay, um, well that that's a little harder. the The thing is that Justin Welby can be so sanctimonious in some areas, and uh, and just well, the th I think the thing is that you know he's thrown his mother on the under the bus by basically telling us all about her sins in detail. Mm -hmm. That. It's a no-go area for me. I'm sorry. I mean, you can talk about your own sins, but when you talk about your mother's sins or your father's sins and then say your reaction to them is due to your mother's sins, I'm sorry. What you're really doing is dumping on your mother again. That's how I see it. And that may be cultural. I don't know. I, I know. I, yeah. Like we discussed in the, our first story that you know families have issues. Clearly, Justin had issues with his mother and father, obviously. And uh, that uh, they are currently, from what I read in that essay, unresolved. I don't think well, his, you know, so. But 
Uh, that can't be the main point of this episode of Unscripted. Yeah. Well, it, it, the there are calls for him to step down from the left over safeguarding failures. Yeah. Over his failure to abide by synod and the LLF. In other words, the LLF was charging forward and Justin Welby stopped it in its tracks. Um, so that he basically is acting in a papal manner, uh, which is an Anglican. Now, I'm glad he stopped in his tracks, <laughs> but nonetheless... I, I don't uh, know. Our, our news cycles kind of slow down since he did that, you know. It, but viewership and, is up, whatever. And this, you know, and now the Church of England's apologizing con for converting Africans to Christianity. And mm -hmm. it's silent over Islamic uh, extremism at home and terror abroad. Uh, Justin Welby gave a speech welcoming, greeting Muslims for Ramadan and saying it's like the Christian Lent. No, it's not. <sighs> Um, God, I'm just a lay person. I know how, how many is, layers of wrong that is. I got to say, I hope the smart people in the Church of England are doing secession planning. With two more years of this, there's not going to be a Church of England for an archbishop to take over. I mean, just look at it this way. The Anglican Communion's relationship with the Archbishop of Canterbury is different between the start and the end of Justin's tenure. The Anglican, the Global South and GAFCON, and if you've not got them down, the majority would say, we need to rethink this whole Canterbury-centric approach. You can still be the primate of all England, but my goodness, you are not the first among equals. We'll have to elect it amongst ourselves, your fellow primates, so that you're not the one that goes meets whoever's the Pope or whoever's the ecumenical patriarch. You know, the new first among equals does because you, Justin Welby, are not trusted and you have destroyed the office. Second, um, the Church of England is in free fall. I mean, it's just had a bad year. And will it survive? It's safeguarding failures. It's, you know, ludicrous statements about, you know, it's, it, it's treating its clergy like dirt, paying them badly. Uh, somebody sent me a thing about the Diocese of Truro, and I haven't checked this out, so I'm taking this on trust. But I think there are the 39 currently working stipendary clergy in the Diocese of Truro, which is Cornwall. And there are 37 people working in the diocese and offices in Truro. Now, if they had a billion pounds to give away, and oh, I'm sorry, and there are about 30 vacancies in okay. Truro for clergy, why don't they just spend that money on filling all the church places? reduce and then you can if, if it's a like, two to one ratio of staff to clergy that's more manageable than a one-to-one -one relationship of pencil pushers and priests um this is a bad situation i mean well but uh, how can us, it get worse, how can well, it get here, worse? Here, here's how it got worse just step back from our 1000 foot view to a, a thirty thousand foot view of the situation 2008, 2007, the formation of years for GAFCON and the ACNN, ACNA. They'll never survive. ACNA won't last three years. Bob Duncan is just, you know, some big lion. He's going to go out there and he's going to, to he's going to ruin it. And there's no way that the ACNA will survive the the women's orders issue. So you can't, not not a chance. And Gafcon, these these guys, they they're just looking for handouts, and this is the fastest way that uh, the the primates can get money from uh, America into their coffers. That, so they're going to collapse too. That 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 was the the saying, and the the thought of your average Anglican in two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Twenty twenty four, is the Church of England going to survive? ACNA is doing just fine, thank you. Nobody's going, is GAFCON going to survive? Now we're asking if the communion itself is going to uh, have a future. These are different questions. I hear rumors that tech may not make it till 2030, 2040. I didn't hear that in 2008. Tech was going to do just fine. That Gene Robinson thing would fill the pews. The years change, George. Okay, we have hit the one hour. Uh, I know we got some more stories. We'll cover them in the next episode because we're professional like that. I'm Kevin Coulson. 
And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode of 847 of Anglican Unscripted.